Hello people. My sincerest apologies for disappearing off the face of the earth. I'm currently sitting on the bed of my dorm room with the little guys. You see, I've had a silly, silly year. Here's a little 2023 by the numbers. Four mental illness diagnoses, three IUDs, one long COVID, one concussion, and one broken phone. But before I get into it, here's some art. I haven't had like any free time whatsoever to make new art like on my own, but I did take a Chinese ink painting class this past quarter and it was very chill. Like chill to the point there was not really any instruction, <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. Okay, now for my year in review. I will preface this by saying that I'm doing so much better now. Thank you, Lord. But earlier in the year, I was for real in my I would like to make myself pass away era. So depressed, panic attacks all the time. She was bleak. After five months on a wait list, because I love our healthcare system in America, I finally got professional help and I was diagnosed with a whole, a whole bunch of things that I don't really want to get into right now. But I will say that Getting these diagnoses was simultaneously validating and devastating. Like it gave me new language to articulate components of my identity and experience, but also it really fucked with my self-perception. I was like, bro, who am I? In retrospect, it is so clear to me that the catalyst of this mental health crisis was my hormonal IUD. Segue, segue. In May of 2022, I got the Liletta IUD inserted. First of all, I wanna know who's coming up with these IUD names because they all sound like strippers. Morena, Liletta, Skyla, Kylina. Anyway, on the Liletta, I bled every day for eight months straight and became suicidal. So I was like, mm-mm, thank you, next. January of this year, I replaced her with the Skyla, which has a lower hormone dose. I was still bleeding erratically and still depresso. So in May, I ejected her and got a copper IUD, which is non-hormonal, which means I was supposed to get my period back. But for five months, the red sea did not flow. And I'm pretty sure it's because I already had hormonal imbalance issues. I'm pretty sure that's why all of this shit ended up the way that it did. So I went back to the gynecologist. She recommended I started hormone replacement therapy. While I was there, I was like, hey, could you perhaps trim the strings of my copper IUD? Cause my boyfriend could kind of feel them. And he said it hurt. She was like, okay, I'll take a look just to see if it's possible. And then she opened me up and was like, oh, actually your IUD is expelling itself. So we actually have to remove it right now. But that also means that it wasn't functioning as birth control. So you have to take a pregnancy test. I was like, bruh, <laughs> no more, no more of this shit. Cumulatively, these IUDs were supposed to last me 18 years, like two decades. And I had them all in and out within one year. If you've never had an IUD inserted or removed, be grateful. That shit is horrific. Anyway, I'm on the pill now. I got infected with the coronavirus. Coronavirus! For the second time in January of this year. First time I got COVID in 2022, I had like a pretty bad cough for three weeks, but then after that I was chilling. I was fine. This time, however, Miss Rona got kind of clingy and she has not left me. For the past 11 months, I've been dealing with chronic fatigue, nausea, migraines, brain fog, insomnia. Sometimes I'm so tired I can't put on my own socks or walk up a flight of stairs without crying or form a coherent sentence or think. It's been tough. There's actually a long COVID clinic here at Stanford, but it's like hella overbooked. I managed to get an appointment though in six months. I love the healthcare system. Okay, so this is actually a very recent L. Last week, I got into a bike accident. Random girly decided to go the wrong way in the roundabout and bike straight into me. I was very dumb and was not wearing a helmet, but you should do 
wear a helmet kids the other girl's fine but i unfortunately slammed my head into the concrete and couldn't see or move for about a minute it felt like a scene from a movie like a bunch of people just like started crowding around me and were like are you okay are you okay and i just like could not respond i was like <laughs> One of these lovely kind strangers called the paramedics and I went to the emergency room and miraculously the noggin is still intact. No fractures or brain damage, but I am concussed and I fucked up my elbow and I got a pretty juicy bruise on my face. I also forgot to add that I bruised my rib, which makes it very hard to laugh or breathe or move or pretty much do anything. The other day, I cried after sneezing, and I almost cry every time I have to lie down or sit up. It even hurts to wash my hands, like pressing down on the soap dispenser is painful. It's tough out here for real. Yesterday, I unfortunately had to take a three hour philosophy final while concussed, and philosophy requires thinking, which is kind of like beyond my capacities right now. I forgot how to spell the word serious. Like I was just dead ass sitting there for like five minutes struggling <laughs> and trying to correctly spell Nietzsche with a traumatic head injury? New challenge unlocked! Speaking of Nietzsche, that fucker was the one who said That which does not kill us make us stronger That's some bullshit! I was actually on my way back from the gymnasium when I got biked into and I have not been back to the gym since I was indeed not killed, but I am in fact not stronger my muscles are atrophying as I speak. The universe is just foiling my plans to become a muscle mommy. How am I supposed to get these gains with all the losses I've endured? Okay, comparatively, this one is far more minor, but it's just been a pain in the ass. The SIM card on my phone started malfunctioning in August and my service would be like on and off but then eventually it stopped working altogether. I contacted my service provider and they said they'd send me a new one, but they never did. So for the past four months, I haven't been able to make or receive phone calls or use my phone at all without Wi-Fi. It's usually fine when I'm at school because there's Wi-Fi everywhere, but it gets extra silly when I'm lost and can't pull up Google Maps or whenever I have to do one of those dual factor authentication things that text you a code. I just like have so many accounts that I can't log into right now. <laughs> and when I got into the bike accident, I had no service, so I couldn't contact anyone. And then later the paramedics and the cops and the doctors were all asking me for my number in case they needed to contact me later. And I was like, sorry about it. You would think that not having a functioning phone might be somewhat liberating and potentially good for the mental health, but this is not the case. Whenever I venture out into the world, I'm just hella stressed all the time. I feel like so much of our basic societal infrastructure is now constructed around the premise of individual smartphone possession. So I guess the solution is retreating into the woods forever. And also I was in LA at the end of the summer in an unfamiliar city with no functioning phone, which is not great. So I went to this phone repair shop and paid this man $137 to fix my phone. And he just said a bunch of words that could have been nothing at all, but I just would have bought it because I don't understand phone technicalities. He was like, oh, I cleaned the, the slot of the SIM card reader of the boo. And I was like, okay, here's my money. <laughs> There's nothing I could do. And it worked for like a day and then it broke again. My roommates got back. I don't know if it's like normal or just like... For some reason, when I hear other people speaking, I just like lose the ability to think. Speaking of my roommates, I wasn't planning on talking about them because I don't want beef, but also probably because I was socialized as a woman and have a deep-seated aversion to expressing anger. And anger is not an emotion I commonly experience. It's really fucking hard to make me mad. Like even the girl who biked the wrong way in the roundabout and got me sent to the ER. I'm like a bit peeved, but it's whatever. The rage I feel toward my roommates on the other hand. <sighs> okay, so I'm in an apartment style room this year and this is how it's laid out. I have a single because I have medical accommodations. They share a double and we all share a common space. My roommates are, unfortunately, incredibly loud people, and they invite their friends over all the time, some of whom live literally in the same hall, like 10 feet away. I really, really wanted to like them. At first I was like, okay, 
it's very clear they both grew up rich and were probably never forced to like be self-aware and share space with others but they're outgoing funny and nice people on the surface at least for weeks i gave them the benefit of the doubt but at this point they are beyond defense here are some clips of my roommates and their shenanigans that i recorded from inside of my room why would i say that I don't what know I've explicitly told them multiple times that because of my long COVID, I have severe fatigue, insomnia, and migraines, and loud noise exacerbates all of this. I politely asked for the most basic accommodations, like trying to be quiet after 10 p.m., or going to their friends' rooms down the hall instead of inviting them here, or talking inside their own room, where the walls are thicker, instead of in the common room, which is literally right outside my door. We sat down and had a conversation about it, and they said, we just don't want to make promises we can't keep. Like, we just want to be realistic about what we can and can't promise you. We're just naturally loud people, and it's just hard for us to be thinking about that all the time. And just like you need your quiet time, we just really need this time to unwind and be social. As much as this is your room, it is equally our room. They seem to think that it was a lifestyle compromise, like... A preference thing and not a medical need. Isn't refusing to accommodate someone's disability because it's inconvenient for you, like textbook ableism? After we had this conversation, they carried on with their ways. And they changed nothing even after I got concussed. Almost every night, I have to ask them to move or be quiet, sometimes multiple times per night. But because I'm a people pleaser and hate conflict, I would always just be like, Hey guys, I would really appreciate it if you could keep it down or go somewhere else, please. Sorry for the inconvenience. Thank you so much for understanding. But I think it just emboldened them to step all over me. I think I gotta just start being like, bro, shut the fuck up. It feels like every other night I'm alternating between crying myself to sleep and lying awake for hours seething with rage. I decided to embark upon this roomy rant after a particularly heinous night a few days ago. They were being hella loud, and I had to remind them three separate times, 10.30 p.m., 11 p.m., and 1 a.m., that I have a concussion and long COVID and really, really need to sleep. Once they were drunk and screaming at 2 a.m. on a Monday night, I was texting my boyfriend about it, and I didn't find out about this until the next day, but he biked like a mile across campus at 2 in the morning, got someone to let him in the building, and then yelled at them. <laughs> He's a real one. But even after being confronted by a kind of intimidating man, the very next day, the roomies were back on the same shit. Another time, they kicked me out for the night because they wanted to throw a party in our room. To be fair, they did inform me a few days in advance, but they didn't really give me the option to say no. I ended up sleeping over at my boyfriend's, sharing a room with three men, and got less than four hours of sleep that night. I'm like genuinely astounded by how inconsiderate they are of other people's needs. This goes beyond willful ignorance. All this to say, I am currently trying to move out, which is a whole bureaucratic mess and it'll probably take months before space opens up. I don't wanna move out. I love my room and I love where I live, but I have to do all the work of moving and they will face zero repercussions and they'll probably never face consequences for their behavior down the road either. I know they will have no trouble being successful in life. They both come from money, so they already have that going for them. Rumi number one is a pretty prominent athlete who's been featured in Sports Illustrated in the New York Times. Rumi number two is super into social entrepreneurship. She just loves businesses that have a social mission and that really make an impact on the world. The irony. The irony! They'll never have to be considerate of other people. They'll never have to realize the world doesn't revolve around them, because the world was constructed to make people like them feel like it does. Shit like this is ubiquitous at Stanford, and probably all elite institutions. It was super disillusioning when I first got here, but now I'm a jaded junior. 
So many of the leaders of our future don't have basic human compassion. Your future doctor probably cheated on their chem exams. The lawyers of tomorrow were probably the devil's advocate bros who worship social contract theory and were allergic to feminism. I recently read Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown, where she uses the principle of emergence to think about social behavior and movement organizing. Emergence is defined as the way complex systems and patterns arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. A core tenet of emergent strategy is the fractal nature of social behavior. Fractals are complex geometrical shapes that are self-similar across different scales, created through the repetition of iterative processes. They're found abundantly in nature. Ferns, Romanesco broccoli, river deltas, vein systems. Brown writes, what we practice at the small scale sets the pattern for the whole system. She quotes activist Grace Lee Boggs, who said, transform yourself to transform the world. I feel like these lessons apply here. If you talk a big game about changing society for the better, with your revolutionary technology or groundbreaking startup, but you can't change yourself for the better and like have basic respect for the people you live with, I do not understand. <sighs> okay, that's my rant. Wait, actually, I just remembered something else. This is so trivial in comparison, but it's just like, bruh! At the beginning of the school year, I bought three cartons of almond milk, and I wasn't planning on opening them until I was like, ready to commit and drink them. But before I had a chance to consume the almond milk that I purchased, roomie number two drank two and a half of my three cartons, and only stopped when I confronted her about it. And at the same time, she already had four other bougie nut milks sitting in the fridge. Like, black sesame and pistachio and whatnot. Every week, this girl consistently drops over $100 on Whole Foods groceries. Girly can afford to not drink my almond milk. Like what? What? Okay, now my rant is actually over. <laughs> I'm gonna go crawl back into bed now. Okay, the title was a little bit clickbait. I've definitely had worse years before. But this year was quite the shitter. I just feel like the universe had it out for me. I don't know if I sinned in my past life and this is just like karmic retribution or maybe 2024 is about to be the most bussing year of my existence and God just had to like humble me a little in preparation. I don't want to make it seem like this year was all bad. There were definitely some hashtag blessed times. This summer I solo traveled around the country and hung out with and photographed and painted some of my bestest friends in the world. This fall, one of my paintings was showing in the De Young Museum in San Francisco. And it even got a little shout out in a New York Times article, which is pretty crazy. And this Thanksgiving break, I spent a week in Tokyo with my boyfriend. It was my first time leaving the country in like a decade. And it was his first time leaving ever. The trip was kind of tough because my fatigue was so bad that I could like barely walk. And there was a lot of public crying. I cried in the Narita airport. I cried in the Tokyo Sky Tree. I cried in multiple train stations. But you know what? I would rather be crying in a beautiful country with good ass food and functioning public transit than on the floor of my dorm room. So yeah, I am manifesting healing and health for myself and for everyone this new year. Hopefully I can get well enough to start making art for you all again. I will be back on my shit eventually, I promise. Thank you for your patience. I love you guys.